Okay, we can start then here. Can people see the slides properly? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What do we exactly mean by circumgalactic medium or CGM? By definition, CGM means the multi-phase gas that surrounds the stellar deep and interstellar medium of a galaxy, and it is expected to be extended out to the burial radius, roughly speaking, the Earth 100 of a galaxy. So, by definition, it is supposed to connect the intergalactic medium to the interstellar medium. As you can see here in the artist illustration, you shouldn't take this too seriously because this is just an, you know image, but uh, the cold gas from the intergalactic medium first comes through the CGM and then it's joined the interstellar medium. And once the stars form, the stellar feedback joins the CGM first and depending on its physical properties, it can recycle back into the ISM again and fuel next generation of star formation. Or it can just leave the galaxy and join IGM or it can hang around here in the CGM as well. So as you can see, CGM is supposed to be a mix of very different gases of very contrasting physical properties. The accretic gas is supposed to be low density, pristine, cold gas, while the outflows are hot, dense, and metal enriched. And because of this mixes, CGM is expected to be multi-phase with both its uh, density and 
temperature spanning more than two orders of magnitude. Implying that we need to observe the CGM across the whole range of electromagnetic spectrum to constrain its physical properties. And as it was nicely put by this review paper, that CGM is the fuel tank, western, and recycle hub of galaxy all at the same time. And in addition to its obvious role in galaxy formation and evolution, there are some fundamental problems related to galaxy evolution that CGM might be able to resolve. And one of them is the missing variance problem. So from the observations of CMB, we already know the ratios of variance and variance plus rough matter is expected to have a constant value. And large halos like galaxy clusters are consistent with that. But once we come from galaxy clusters to lower mass halos, for example, individual galaxies, things, to be, things seem to be very different from what we expect. For example, what I'm showing here is the variant fraction as a function of stellar mass across three orders of magnitude. And variant fraction is normalized here. So if a galaxy halo is variant sufficient, we would expect the variant amount to be consistent with one shown with the horizontal line here. But as you can see, the amount of mass in stars shown here in the red patch and the amount of mass in interstellar medium, which is shown here in blue, that's at most 20% of what we expect it to be which means more than 80% of mass in these galaxies are missing. And if these galaxies are very insufficient, rest of the mass has to be in the stratum galactic medium. So that is one of the problems CG might be able to resolve. The next one is the missing metals problem. So here in the bottom panel, I'm showing the metals fraction as a function of stellar mass, the same range of stellar mass. And metals fraction in this case means the ratio of mass of observed to expected metals. Now we all know that stars form metals and as they die they throw out all the metals in the interstellar medium. And for a given stellar population, we expect a certain amount of metals in stars and interstellar medium. So we can observe that and compare that with what we expect. But what is found here is that the metals fraction combining all of the metals in interstellar dust and gas and stars, that's again only 20% of what we expect. And that means, if we understand the process of uh, nucleosynthesis properly, then the rest of the 20%, sorry, rest of the 80% metals has to be missing from the disk of galaxies. That means it might have been thrown out into the stuck of galactic medium. So, and, yeah. So, when you write the variance fraction, yes. you see, empty constant is less than constant one, because variance fraction. Right. That's why I Yes. And then, how do you, so mass of X, population, we know so what is stellar nucleus is. Yes. Yeah. So these two problems are that way very different, although when you are tracing the missing variance, you are also you know, tracing a fraction of metals as well. And if the metals are missing from the disk and thrown out in the CGM, that means some of the energy and momentum is also missing, because when the galactic feedback carries these variance and metals from the disk to the halo, it also carries some amount of energy and momentum. And it's also consistent with extra observations. That is where the missing feedback problem actually comes in. And uh, from the observations of the disk of galaxies in X-ray, it's found that the soft X-ray luminosity is actually almost a factor of five or even lower than what you expect. Which means all of the variance, metals, and feedback, they together might be missing, and CGA might be able to resolve all of this together. Now, all of these are roughly speaking related to the hot CGM, that is one extreme phase of the CGM. But the other extreme is the cold neutral phase, which fuels the star formation. And that is where the other problem, missing accretion problem, comes in. So, here in the left, I'm showing the image in 21 centimeter emission of a local galaxy. By local, I mean roughly within 20 megaparsec. And here you can clearly resolve the disk of the galaxy. And from the kinematics of the neutral hydrogen gas, you can calculate the accretion rate. So that is the rate at which hydrogen is being supplied to the galaxy. And in the right hand side, I'm showing an UV image where you can calculate the star formation rate. Now, if the accreting gas is converting to stars at 100% efficiency, you 
would expect these two terms to be similar. But if the efficiency is less than the accretion rate, you would expect the star formation rate to be less than accretion rate. So in no way you would expect the star formation rate to be larger than the accretion rate because that's unbiblical. You cannot, you know, form stars out of the fields that's not available to you. But what's found in the local inverse is that the star formation rate is actually a factor of 5 to 10 larger than the visible accretion rate. And that means rest of the accretion can actually be in the circumgalactic medium. And just because CGM is harder to observe, it has not been detected yet. But if we understand the formation of you know, accretion and its conversion to star formation, rest of the CGM has to be accreting some amount of mass. So by now, I, I would say that I have roughly convinced you why observing CGM is important. And here is a brief timeline of how the CGM has been studied so far. So back in 1956, Pitzer had actually predicted the existence of CGM without labeling as circumgalactic medium. So the idea was that there could be some gas above and below the disk, which is in pressure equilibrium with the disk, and its temperature was predicted to be million Kelvin. And if it's million Kelvin, that means you need to observe it in the X-ray. But it took almost 40 years to observe it in X-ray with Rosen Allspy survey. I'll come back to this again later and talk about it in detail. But until this, the observation was actually following the theory. But now the table has turned. And in the next 20 years, the CGM has been observed across the whole range of electromagnetic spectrum to constrain its different phases. And none of these satellites or telescopes were designed to observe CGM. So CGM has come as, I would say, a byproduct of other science goals. And whatever we have found so far has been very promising. And in the next two decades, actually, CGM has been one of the highest priority goals. And some of the upcoming telescopes are being designed, keeping CGM as one of its high priority science goals. So this is where you know the observations are now informing the theories. And here is a brief summary of what I'm interested in right now. And this is the first one where I am exploring the interaction between the galactic feedback and the circumgalactic medium. Here I use the combination of X-ray emission and absorption spectroscopy to constrain the history of Milky Way's galactic feedback. And this is the main topic of today. The other project I am doing is observing the CGM of external galaxies. And there we are trying to understand whether gravity or feedback is the dominating property. You know, gravitating is, gravitation is an inward property while feedback is supposed to throw out the gas. And it is not clearly understood what is the dominating property in the CGM. For example, in the right hand side, here is a speculation from theories. If gravity is the dominating property, we would expect the soft extra luminosity as a function of specific star formation rate to follow this red line. And all of these galaxies have similar stellar mass, so the only thing that is varying is star formation rate. And this is the expected line. But if feedback is really important, in that case, in addition to gravitation, feedback will also affect the CGM luminosity. And in that case, we will find that the luminosity will actually, the luminosity will, you know, almost roughly linearly increase with the star formation rate. And observing this is really hard. And so far, we have been able to detect the hot CGM around just one external galaxy. So. Reaching at this level will take time, but I'll briefly talk about the detection in one galaxy in the end of the talk. The other project I'm doing is roughly similar in science goal, but in that case, we are trying to constrain the CGM in a statistical way. So here we take the galaxy catalogs and cross-correlate them with the millimeter mass in Compton Y. And there we stack over almost millions of galaxies to detect the CGM uh, which is, you know, orders of magnitude fainter than its more massive galaxies. And here our goal is very simple, whether or not it follows the self-similar relation or not. Which means if the gravity is the dominating uh, property in CGM, you would expect the more massive galaxies and more massive galaxy groups and clusters. Everything is following the same relation. While uh, it is expected that in low mass galaxies, the feedback could be important. And because of that, it might deviate from the self-similar relation. So this galaxy might be selected from the uh, This is the Weiss catalog. Weiss? Yes. 
So this is the mass strength that has not been studied before. That is why we are now pushing it to the lower mass chemistries. And the other project I am doing is related to the missing accretion problem. So here we look for the 21 centimeter emission in the system of local galaxies. And we try to correlate them with the star formation rate of these local galaxies. So I'm not going to talk about these projects, but if anyone is interested, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to talk about it later. Okay. So let's come back to the main uh, topic of today's talk. Uh, exploring the feedback CGM chemistry in the hot CGM of primarily Milky Way and also other Milky Way like Elster galaxies. Now Elster galaxies are particularly interesting for a reason. Here I'm showing the ratio of stellar to halo mass or virial mass as a function of the halo mass. And uh, this curve peaks at the halo mass of Elster galaxies. And that means for a given amount of variance, Elster galaxies are the most efficient to convert them into stars. And that means if we are trying to understand the evolution of disk and halo together, Elster galaxies are the most efficient ones. So that is why we would expect the maximum amount of exchange between the disk and the halo. This is why if we are interested in the CGM, Elster galaxies should be the best reward. Whose sideline is 
passing through the CGM. In that case, the metals in the CGM will absorb certain, uh, depending on their transitions, they will absorb some of the lights and that is what we will see in the absorption spectrum. And in our case, we focus on the casual transitions because we are looking at higher energies and uh, primarily we look for K-alpha and K-beta transitions. They are the strongest ones. And for metals, our focus is primarily on oxygen or other helium light and hydrogen light ions. By helium light and hydrogen light, I mean the metals that are left with one or two electrons. And the temperature we are probing, uh, hydrogen and helium are completely ionized. So in case of metals, in case of absorption, we have to look to only metals. And for the same metals, you can look at their emission lines. But in case of emission, since the gas is completely ionized, in addition to the emission lines, there is also the free free continuum. So the absorption spectrum roughly looks like this, where you have a continuum. And in addition to that, you have some uh, emission lines, depending on what metals you have. Now going back to the rosette uh, detection again, we already know that Spitzer had predicted it and after 40 years, Rosat had detected it for the first time. But the way Rosat detected is very different from how we observe the CGM today. So Rosat did not really have the whole wavelength coverage or energy coverage. What it had is just some separate bands and depending on an ACD, you could have just calculated the photon ratios. And from that, from the all sky distribution, you could have figured out whether it's a local emission or coming far, far away. Because if it's a local emission, you already know what its ACD is. And if it's coming from beyond the galactic base, in the soft X-ray, it's supposed to be absorbed by the galactic team. So the Rosette team found that in addition to the local emission, what we call the local hot bubble, which is basically a million Kelvin bubble-like structure in our solar neighborhood, in addition to that, there is another component which has similar temperature, but it's beyond the disk of the galaxy. And that's what they labeled as transabsorption emission because it is coming beyond the galactic absorption. And eventually that has been labeled as CGM with the follow-up observations. Now here is a typical absorption spectrum. After Rosette, there came Chandra, XMM Newton and Suzaku and all of them had the emission facilities and in addition to that Chandra and XMM Newton also had the absorption facilities. So this is how a typical absorption spectrum look like. The bright background is the source that has this continuum and the main thing we should look at are these absorptions from oxygen 7 and oxygen 8. And the main observables here are the temperature and the column densities. Similarly in emission you can look for the same emission features for example Oxygen 7 and 8, they emit here with these bumps. And in addition to these bumps, you also have the continuum. In both cases, you can calculate the temperature. And also in emission, since you have the continuum, you can calculate the emission measure, which is basically your density square integrated along the line of sight. Now you can do that both in emission and absorption separately, or you can combine them and get the density and mass and calculate, uh, compare that with the mass of the disk and so on. So, yep. when do you see absorption and when do you see emission? Depending on, uh, I mean, what? You just say that both had emission facilities and absorption, then what do you see by that? I mean, uh, Chandra, XMM and Suzaku, you can observe uh, CGM in emission with all of them, but uh, you need gratings to observe the absorption, and Suzaku didn't have that. So, for absorption, you need Chandra. So you need just see a better resolution. Yeah, because I mean, for these faint absorption lines, you need the gradient uh, density. And when will these two things happen? I mean, if you are looking at the shaded yeah. line region, depending on the different line of sight. Yeah. So if you have a bright background, you are seeing the absorption because your main emission is coming from the target. And if you are looking at a blank sky, then you see the emission. The from bright the background is some yeah. other poison. distance. I mean, these are not intrinsic to the cohesion, this is zero rate shift absorption. Yes. So, you are looking at a cohesion spectrum, you are taking out all the things that you think are from the cohesion and then. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, since it is Milky Way CGM, it should be zero rate shift, so that is another way to identify that. And this 
also observed in division, but this is a blank sky, which means for many other people, this is just the diffuse extra background, and they use it as just the background to compare with much brighter sources, but in our case, this is the signal. So, where is the CTS here? So, this uh, green curve is the emission from the CGM. And that's your green, right? Yeah, this is the green. XMM always had that problem of very strong instrumental lines. So all of our emission are below 1 keV. So you should just look at this region. Yeah, that's more emission. That's, 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 that's a volume is just what you extract from the data. That's what we extract from the data. Yeah. So you have a lot of components here. Yes. And uh, yeah, you have to model the whole emission to extract the emission from the CGM. Yeah. Similar. As you can see, 
I hope you can see this temperature range is shown. And it indicated that oxygen 8 could have come from a hotter temperature, while oxygen 6 is coming from a lower one, and oxygen 7 is actually coming from both of them. So the assumption that all of the oxygen 6 and 7 are coming from the same phase might not be true. Now, there are certain limitations of including oxygen 6 in this analysis. One of them is kind of logistical because you have to observe O6 with UV while the other ions are coming from X-ray. And it is not always easy to get you know, UV and X-ray data along the same side line. And the other limitation is that oxygen 6 is a lithium-like ion because it has three electrons. And they are very unstable and they are likely to recombine to either oxygen 5 or ionize to oxygen 7. On the other hand, oxygen 6, uh, sorry, oxygen 7 and 8, they dominate the ion population. So if you are probing a phase that is dominated by a certain ion, that is going to be the best tracer, for example, oxygen 7. So that way, oxygen 6 is not the best uh, tracer to look at this phase, and that is why we take an alternative view. So we keep it to only X-ray instead of going to UV. And in addition to oxygen 7 and 8, we look for the helium-like and the hydrogen-like ions of other metals. For example, carbon, nitrogen, neon, magnesium, and silicon. Basically, whatever you can cover within your wavelength range in that X-ray spectrum. So here I'm showing the ionization fraction as a function of temperature. And these dashed lines are for the helium-like. And these are the lithium-like ions. As I said, they never dominate the ion population. So they are not a good tracer as such. And these solid lines are for the hydrogen-like ions. So for each of these elements, we can look for the hydrogen-like and helium-like. Then we can take the ratio for the temperature. And we compare between the temperatures. Are they same or not? If they are same, that means all these elements are coming from the same temperature. And if they are not, that means you need to model it to figure out what the temperatures are. And also, as a byproduct, you are also getting the abundance ratios. Because if you have more than one metal, you can always get their abundance ratios. So this is this comes from PMT because cloudy is for more lower ionization phases. But the basic idea is the same. And that is the main reason people have looked for oxygen for the last 20 years. And since you are looking at much lower column densities, basically lower abundant metals, your signal to noise of the spectrum has to be really high. And by deep measurement, I mean kind of you know megasecond long observations. So we started with an 1.86 megasecond long data, and the data was not given just for CGM observations. This uh, particular sideline had some tentative detections of intergalactic medium, the one hot intergalactic medium. So CGM also came as a byproduct in that case. Now, as you can see, it's a very high signal to noise spectra. You can see strong lines. And most of these lines were expected, such as nitrogen lines, oxygen lines, and neon 9. But what was unexpected was neon 10, because uh, at this temperature of million Kelvin, that is already known to be the temperature of CGM, you don't expect a neon 10 line. And this was the first time this line was detected in the CGM. Yeah. Yeah. So these are all zero ratio lines. And as we had suspected, the temperatures for neon, oxygen, and nitrogen, they were not similar to each other. And additionally, we also find the pollen densities are all similar. While in a solar-like composition, we would expect the oxygen to be a factor of 4 to 5 lighter than our neon and nitrogen. So that was already indicating that there might be more than one temperature, and also the chemical composition might be different from solar-like. So we did a hybrid ionization modeling to calculate the temperature and the ion to, sorry, metal to metal abundance ratios. And note that we cannot calculate the absolute metallicity here, for example, oxygen to H because we do not have any hydrogen lines here. So what we found was kind of surprising, because first of all, there was a super BDL phase at 10 million Kelvin, where the neon 10 and oxygen 8 was coming from, in addition to the million Kelvin gaps. 
So here, as you can see, oxygen is uh, seven is coming from the million Kelvin gas, as we have seen before, and there were other metals as well. But oxygen eight and neon ten was actually coming from a hotter phase, and that means the assumption of all of the oxygen six and seven coming from the same phase was oversimplified. And additionally, we also found that nitrogen and neon both are supersolar compared to oxygen. So here the gray lines are showing the best fit lines, but if you assume the nitrogen and neon to be solar like, the as a, the predicted lines will be much weaker shown here with the blue lines and the green lines here, and that indicates you have to have some excess neon and excess nitrogen along this side. We also found that this phase is alpha enhanced. We did not detect any iron lines, so we started with assuming a solar like composition. But in a solar like composition, there will be a lot of strong iron lines shown here with the blue lines here. But none of these were detected, as you can see in the data. And that means there is a lack of iron. And in the, in the other way, you can say the gas is alpha enhanced. And all of these you would expect in a supernova like feedback. But the main problem is that in a Milky Way like galaxy, you won't expect such a strong evidence of supernova feedback in the CG. Had it been something like a starburst galaxy, it would be a different case. But for Milky Way, it was very surprising. And we followed up this with an emission uh, search because if this gas is present in absorption, it is quite likely that it will be also detected in emission if it's dense enough. And we also actually detected here uh, both the super virial and the virial phase. I mean, emission spectra are really hard to see because you have a lot of mess going on. But the main things you should look at here are the peaks. So these peaks are coming from oxygen 7, and these peaks are coming from oxygen 8. So both in absorption and in emission, we find the same thing. Oxygen 7 is coming from the virial phase, oxygen 8 is coming from the super virial, both in emission and absorption. So, but this is in another line of sight or the. This is a nearby blank sight. And also about these extra lines, yes. how do you know that this is not from something else like the intergalactic medium or, I mean, I'm not sure what can it be, but I'm just yes. asking that this, uh, I mean, you are seeing many absorption lines, one of them you seem to think that, okay, this is not expected, we are seeing this. So, yes. is there any, any other way to get something like that? Since you say that this is also, there is some much intergalactic medium in that. But that's a higher red shift. These are all zero red shift lines. The GUIM I was saying, that's I think at uh, 0 0.1 something. So, the, I mean, you won't expect the neon 10 line to be there, first of all. And if you identify a line, there has to be corresponding stronger lines at the same red shift, right? And that was not uh, there. So, I mean, the first thing was to detect that, and the next was to identify it as neon 10 at the red shift. So, it's almost like For example, this is the local hot bubble that is shown here in the purple here. We also have the charge exchange here, which is shown here in the red. It's pretty low energy. I mean, this is yeah. below, below, below an AED. Yeah. So, is that the so any reason that we show that to exoplanet or, for example, Chandra? But Chandra's field of view is really small. Yes. So, for the 
diffuse emission, you would prefer large field of view. So you would diffuse it for the field of view. Yeah. And also large effective area, both. Is it possible you can still do maybe lots of rain, but you can do something in Chandra? Chandra's, I mean, right now Chandra's low energy has practically died. Yeah, that's right. And even in the previous ones, people have tried it, but because of the low field of view, it was not that easy. Yeah, so I'll come to that later. We have also done it with Sujaku. But the reason we did it with XMM in this case, because we had already done the absorption in XMM Newton. So, you know, if XMM is observing in breaking, you also have the emission observations in the same eye. So just to save time. So, yeah. So we detected the superbillion phase, both in emission and absorption. But this was only one side line, and we were really not sure where exactly in the CPM it is coming from, as in it is, is it very close to the disk or is it very much extended? It was not clear. And one year after that, the Erosita bubble was discovered, and we found that our side line is actually passing through a fainter section of the Erosita bubble, which was previously not detected in the rosette, low sensitivity rosette data. Now, I'm not going to talk about the Erosita bubble itself, but since our sideline was very close, it was not clear if, you know, this hot gas is related to the bubble itself or is it a generic property of the CGM. And also, we tried to fit the emission of the superbillial gas, which was actually by chance consistent with the Erosita bubble, but we couldn't explain the gas in absorption. So that means, I mean, just because it was in the bubble can explain the gas in emission doesn't mean it is coming from the bubble, but at least there was a consistency. But the gas in absorption could not be explained with that. So that led to two questions. One is that, is the gas in emission actually from the bubble? And the other question is, is the emission and absorption coming from the gas? Uh, I mean, are they co-special or not? Do they have same physical origin or not? And uh, no, Fermi bubble is much smaller, so uh, Fermi bubble will be somewhere here. And actually, in the next slide, I'll be showing that. So, to look for the ubiquity of this superbillial gas, now we use the archival data from Suzaku across the whole sky to our 240 blank sky sight lines to look for this superbillial gas. And here, this uh, red solid line is roughly the boundary of Erosita bubble, and these dashed lines are the boundary of Fermi bubble. So the Fermi bubble is emitting in gamma ray, while the Erosita bubble is emitting in soft X-ray. And the summary of this analysis is that more than 60% of sight lines had these, you know, 10 million Kelvin superbillial gas, which indicated that we have this gas kind of in a ubiquitous way across the whole sky. And we also found that it is not exactly related to the CGM science, but it also came out that the Erosita bubble is brighter because it's denser. It has an order of magnitude larger emission because of its uh, high density, but not the temperature. Because we are finding the same hot gas within the bubble and outside the bubble, but just the emission measure is varied. And it is exactly opposite to what was assumed in the discovery paper. Because in the discovery paper, they didn't have any spectrum. So they just assumed something is bright, so it has to be hot, and rest of the calculation followed that. And if you assume the Erosita bubble to be hotter, the age of the shock, which follows a lot of steps in between, but the age of the shock seems to be very low, and that prefers the AGM-driven feedback. But in our case, since we are finding the bubble is denser and not hotter, that leads to a much you know, older shock, and that prefers the starburst-driven feedback. So right now, it is debatable, and we do not know, but at least we know that this Superbillial phase is present across the whole sky. And recently it has been actually followed up by a different team called HelloSat, which is a small CubeSat designed to only look for this diffuse gas in the Milky Way. And they follow pretty much the same kind of analysis as us. I'm not going to talk about the detail of this, but the summary is pretty much same as us. You have the superbillial gas across the sky, you find the same temperature distribution as we found with Suzaku. You find the same emission, emission measure distribution as we found with Suzaku. So these two studies from Suzaku and Hilosat, they are in remarkable agreement. And another interesting thing is that Suzaku's field of view is much smaller. It's only 17 half minutes. While Hilosat's field of view is 10 degrees, so that's huge. 
and the fact that we are finding similar emission measure in both cases indicated that the supervillian phase has to be very diffuse. Because if you are looking at clumpy things, it will be washed out in large field of view. But that is not something that happens in this case. Was that your cube set? It was a cube set. It was a cube set. So their main focus was to observe the CTM of Milky Way. And with 10 degree radius, they have covered the whole star. So in emission, we have now established that the supervirial phase is ubiquitous. But doing it in absorption is actually hard because you need a very high signal to noise spectrum and also, you know, in archive at least there are, I would say, four or five sidelines like that. So it is not that easy to do in absorption. So we start with another high signal to noise data and now instead of doing XML, we are doing it with Chandra because it has a larger wavelength coverage. And larger wavelength coverage means you can look at more metal lines. And we started with nitrogen and neon, but now we have expanded it to carbon in this side and magnesium and silicon in this side. So basically more metals you have, more temperature ranges you can go. And here in addition to the neon 10 line that we detected again, we also detected a silicon 14 line for the first time. And both of these are supposed to come from the 10 million Kelvin gas. So we found that gas again. But here, in addition to all other lines we expected, we also found a strong carbon-5 line. And that you expect from below the million Kelvin gas. So even before doing any modeling or anything, just from the detection, we already had expected that there will be more than one or even more than two temperatures. <coughs> Excuse me. And the other reason of choosing this side line is that it's exactly away from the galaxy. So in the other uh, sideline, as I have shown you, that the sideline was passing through the erosive bubble. But now that it is absolutely away from the galactic center, we know that there is no other X-ray feature. So whatever we detect is likely to be the generic property of the city. And as we had suspected, there are actually more than one or two temperature phases. And uh, oxygen 8 and neon 10, as I had shown before, is coming from the 10 million Kelvin superior phase. But now that we also have silicon 14, more pressures you have, better constraints you have. So in this case, we have a better constraint of this temperature. We also have the virial phase as we expect for most of the lines. But now we also have a sub phase that is usually observed with UV, but now in X-ray we are observing all these temperature phases together. And uh, we also found that the chemical composition, qualitatively speaking, is same as the other side lines. So remember that these side lines are you know, separated by more than 30 degrees in the sky. So you do not expect these side lines to be related by any way. But we still find that the chemical composition is different from solar, qualitatively speaking. But the actual values are a total maze. In the other side line, we just found that neon and nitrogen are supersolar, and that's all. But in this case, you have more pressures, so you are getting many different ratios. And we find that some metals are supersolar in some phase, they are not in the other phase, and so on. For example, magnesium 11 here, you can see a very strong magnesium line. And for a solar line composition, you would expect such a weak line of magnesium. And this is only for the virial phase. But we find magnesium to oxygen to be solar in the supervirial. Similarly, neon 10 here, in the supervirial phase is showing a super solar chemical composition because again the gray lines are all based field. So whatever the solar light composition is shown with the colored lines and in case of neon it's exactly the other way. So magnesium is super solar in the virial phase, neon is super solar in the supervirial phase but when you flip the other two phases you find them to be solar. So right now, we do not really understand what is going on since all these chemical compositions are changing from one phase to the other. So one possibility is that, as predicted, CGM is inhomogeneous. So what we are probing is the inhomogeneity itself. Or the cooling itself will be different for different metals. But right now, this is just uh, the observations and we are trying to understand. So and the power of change speed of the absorption? 10 to the power 14, 15. In the metals or in hydrogen? Metals. Metals. Yes. Yes. And we 
Similarly, you also find uh, alpha enhancement here because if you had uh, solar light composition, you will see all these strong iron lines, but we do not see none of these lines. So here, uh, in addition to all these, in this side line, we were also able to constrain the non-thermal sources. Remember that in X-ray, we cannot really resolve the lines itself. So in addition to K-alpha lines, you also need the K-beta lines. And once you have two lines, you can combine them to get the total broadening. And since you have the temperature, you also know the thermal broadening. So you compare them to get the non-thermal broadening. And here we were able to constrain that for the virial phase for the first time. People had usually assumed to be like 300 km per second, which is consistent with our finding. But this is the first time we were able to constrain it. So this is roughly speaking the summary of what we find from the multi-tracer absorption studies that in addition to the virial phase that was already known for last 20 years, we have a super virial phase. We do not understand its physical origin, but it's there across the whole sky. And we also have a sub virial phase that's usually observed in UV. But the good thing here is that you can observe all of them together in one sight line and you do not need the UV spectrum to constant that phase. And also we find some very different kinds of abundance ratios and none of these are well understood, but this is what we find. Now, recently, yeah. Sorry, you mentioned that the dotted contours. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, if you just detect the K-alpha line, you just have to assume some non-thermal broadening. In this case, we are calculating the actual broadening from the lines. What so do you mean by non-thermal broadening? So you have a total broadening of yes. the line, which is... Like or you mean the physical origin yes. of the non-thermal broadening? That could be a combination of turbulence, cosmic ray, magnetic field, anything. And I see. Okay. We don't know what the source is. But we at least know what the actual values are. And then you, you, you differentiate between the thermal broadening and the non-thermal broadening by what? The shape parameters of the spectrum or? Uh, no, we are getting the total, total broadening separately and the thermal broadening is coming from the temperature. That's because, right. So yeah. you have the this, yeah, uh, we have, uh, like if I go to the previous slide, so right. this is basically the difference. Yeah. So then you subtract and you Yeah, that the is the thing. Yeah. And this is, I would say, roughly speaking, the summary of whatever the absorption studies we have been so far. And recently what we are doing is that, in addition to looking for the super virial phase in emission, we are now trying to do the chemical tagging, which means we are trying to understand which element is the most responsible for the emission. In case of absorption, you can directly see the metal line, so you know what metal you are tracing. But in case of emission, as you have seen, it's a combination of many things. In case of the virial phase, we already know the oxygen lines are emitting most of the things. And that I have shown in the previous slides. But in case of uh, super virial phase, as oxygen is almost completely ionized, we really do not know which metal is responsible for most of the emission. And that is what we did here. So this uh, black line, this black circle is basically around the absorption site line where we found the super virial gas. And now we look for the gas within 5 degree radius. And we were able to detect the gas in all of the sight lines. And the similarity with the previous observations is that we again find that, first of all, the gas, super virial gas is present. And we also find the emission measure is larger in the virial phase than the super virial phase. So all the observations have been consistent that way. And in addition to that, what we find is that in the super virial phase, iron l shell lines are actually the most dominant emitters. So the way you should look at these plots is that the top panel is ionization fraction as a function of temperature. And you can see a lot of iron lines shown here. So for absorption studies, that is what you should look at because if the ionization fraction is high, you will see a higher absorption. And this is the, the vertical line is where we find the temperature of the super virial gas in absorption. But in emission, it's completely different because first of all, emission depends on density square. So
So instead of ionization fraction, you should look at ionization fraction square. And also you have the factor of emissivity, which is like the probability of the transition from the excited to the ground state. And the combination of them decides which metal is the most responsive. So you don't expect the absorption and emission features don't, don't look the same in this temperature range at least. And in case of video phase, it was already known for oxygen, but now we are seeing that because of the difference in the emissivity of iron, all of these temperature measurements shown here with this dashed line, they are much smaller than the absorption measure. So the way we interpret it is that in case of emission, first of all, iron is the most abundant. And because of its emissivity, we are uh, measuring a temperature much lower than absorption. Because you can have a lot of gas across a whole range of temperature. But the gas you will detect in emission is where it is more likely to detect more likely to emit than other temperatures. But in absorption, we do not have that kind of bias. So you are observing everything together. And that's why in emission, this bias has always been a point of concern. And now we figure out that this bias is happening due to iron. We always know that that, that, the, that bias will be there, but figuring out which metal is responsible was the main problem. Now the interesting thing is that, as I've already told in absorption, iron lines were absent. And in emission, we are find iron lines are responsible for the emission. And that clearly tells you that the emission and absorption cannot come from the same place because you don't expect you know, iron enrichment and lack of iron in the same place. And that actually creates more problem because we do not understand the physical origin of none of the insect. And to add to that, we have a recent stacking analysis coming from which is not much different from the individual side lines, but the only difference is that here you are calculating the all sky average to see if this superbarrier phase is also present in absorption across the whole sky. And here, as you can see, we have a very strong lines of silicon 14 and uh, sulfur 16. And even before doing any modeling, we already know that these lines are coming from the superbarrier phase. So right now, the main two problems that uh, we need to resolve is, first of all, what is the physical origin of the superbarrier phase? It has to be somehow related to the galactic feedback, but uh, we do not really know whether it's the agent feedback or the stellar feedback, but it's clear that only the nuclear feedback cannot resolve all of these. In the Eurocyte bubble that I had shown, that has caused because of the nuclear feedback, but now that we are observing it even beyond the Eurocyte bubble, that means there has to be something else that is causing this superbarrier phase outside the Eurocyte bubble. So there could be two different feedbacks that have caused the bubble and the superbarrier phase outside the bubble. And the other problem is the sources of this non-solar chemical composition. So uh, here I'm not going to talk about all of these sources, but these metals that are highlighted within the green squares, those are the ones we are probing. And from the nucleosynthetic sources, the main two distinctions we know is that iron comes from type 1A, the other metals come from corpulas. So if you are finding alpha enhancement, that's what we see in absorption, there has to be somehow an effect of corpulas feedback. But in emission, as we are also finding iron, that means there could also be some oh, type 1A feedback, but they are not co-special. So the thing we are now speculating is that the superbarrier gas in emission is coming from a recent type 1A that is closer to the disk and that's much denser. That's why you see it in emission. But the gas, the same superbarrier gas in absorption is much extended and this is much low density. So it had got enough time to you know, spread to a much larger radius. And that is stressing the fast corpolar supernova feedback. But this is just a speculation and we need to observe more to constrain it. Yes. Cannot solve all of these as far as we know. So 
So what is possible is that we have to revise our feedback prescription as in the metal loading factors of the galactic wings. It is not just about producing the metals, we have to carry them to the CGM. And the other thing is the mixing of feedback and the pre-existing gas. So what we are seeing could be very inhomogeneous and depending on how things have mixed and cooled with time, we are seeing the residual, right, in the hot gas. So it's a combination of the feedback prescription plus the metal loading uh, plus the mixing. And right now we are trying to understand what could be the exact origin. And it is supposed to be a mix of many things, that is why it has been so hard to figure out. So coming back to this slide that I have showed many slides before. So if you observe the CGM only with oxygen, Milky Way CGM is very well behaved, everything fits with theory and so on. But just the moment you include all other metals, you find that the whole thing changes. First of all, you have this super virial gas in addition to the virial phase. And the absorption and uh, emission temperatures do not match that I had shown. You also have non-solar chemical composition. You find non-thermality. And also, if you have a super virial gas, it will have some non-zero mass. So the mass of the CGM also needs to be reduced. So what we find is that actually instead of solving problems, we have created more problems by observing with more metals. But that also shows that we do not really understand the history of Milky Way's feedback. And if we do not understand Milky Way itself, it will be harder to observe the external galaxies more. So I'll briefly mention the observation of other galaxies. But as I have said, so far we have been able to detect the CGM around the Milky Way-like galaxy for only one galaxy. So we can't really talk about much, uh, much in this case. But the main challenge here is that you have all these foregrounds and backgrounds that I had shown before. But now Milky Way CGM itself is also a foreground. So you have two different galaxies. They are emitting same kind of signals. And the only distinction you have is that one of them is the foreground and the other is the signal from your target galaxy. So identifying that signal and identifying that as the CGM of that target is the main challenge here. And it also involves your perfect target selection and so on. So, so far we have been able to detect it only around one galaxy, which has a very high specific star formation rate. And that was one of the main reasons to choose it. Because if you have high star forming activity, you expect a stronger feedback and so on. And you are probably more likely to detect the CGM around that galaxy. So we first did that study with Suzaku and then followed it up with XML Newton. And in both cases, we were not only able to detect that, there was a remarkable similarity in all of the other physical properties. So this is the only galaxy where we have been able to detect. And uh, I'm not going to talk about all the things we find from here, because most of them are consistent with theory. The two things that are not consistent is, one is the surface, bri uh, surface brightness profile. So you just get the surface brightness as a function of azimuth. And in this case, the uh, zero means here the minor axis. And then you just you know go around the azimuth to get the surface brightness as a function of position. ID. And what we find is that there is actually a lack of surface brightness along the minor axis, which means there is a deficit. And the way it could be interpreted is that there is a cavity. And since such an extra cavity exists in the CGM of Milky Way, or, and also has been recently found in case of Andromeda, it is not impossible to find in an external galaxy. And what we also find is that the temperature is not constant, especially within 100 kiloparsec, the temperature is increasing. And if you combine these two results together, it is possible that the feedback had dumped some thermal energy, and it has also thrown out some of the pre-existing halo gas, and thus creating the cavity. But obviously, from this quality of data, we cannot really confirm a lot of things. And now we have asked for a deeper data in XML Newton. I'm not going to talk about all of these projects together, but the summary is that we are going to get as much detail of the CGM of Milky Way first and exploit the archives as much as possible. And now, based on those archives, we can make a case for the prism, which has been launched already, and also for the upcoming extra telescopes. So having said that, I'll stop. Thank you. Time for questions. Yes, origin and then Obinanda. 